brothers and sisters, let us uh, begin with a silent prayer. Okay, this morning we're going to look at this um, <coughs> uh, continuation of this subject that we've been looking at in regards to the reform lines. And um, <coughs> the last two presentations we were showing you all the principles about how God is going to bring the, the, the truth at the end of the world based upon the principle of the Alpha and Omega. And uh, how he brings that is line upon line. It's the latter rain and the latter rain comes in both the former and the latter. And it comes line upon line. It's based upon a line which is a delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And the Lord wants to reform us. And in order to reform us, he has to also revive us. And the revival and reformation must blend. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in the form of the latter rain. And these two, two reigns, the former and the latter, which is doctrine. And it's a doctrine that cleanses us of all our wrong understandings and leads us to a point where the Lord can fill us with his Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is uh, what we've been looking at and based upon the principle of the Alpha and Omega, I want to begin with the Alpha of Bible prophecy and that's Moses and I want to show you that uh, these lines we're going to look at, we're going to look at four lines specifically, the line of Moses, the line of Christ, the line of Ezra and the Miller Red Line, and once these four lines are in place, then it will lead us down to our time where we can begin to unfold all the things that are going to happen in our time. So the reason why I was saying Moses in the Alpha, because we're going to see that the, when we looked at these things, the Alpha was the types and the Omega the antitype. And I want to, to lay out this line first, this is the line of Moses, and show that it's the, the type of Christ, who is the antitype. We're going to see how these two lines perfectly parallel each other, right? And very, very distinct. So um, let's begin. And uh, what I want to look at first is this um, point that precedes a reform line. And why do we need a reform of a reform line? Well. As we looked at, to reform is to bring you from a, a worse state back to a, an original state that you were in, which was good. So, <clears throat> prior to the reform line, there's always darkness because the reform line involves light. So when light comes, it dispels the darkness. Okay, and that, that's what reforms us, it's light. So if we don't have light, then we're in darkness. So whatever precedes the reform line is a period of darkness. And in the case of Moses, in uh, Genesis 15, this was the promise given to Abraham, verses 13 and 14, it says, And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. So the seed, the promised seed that was given to Abraham, which in, a, in one sense was Christ, but in a perfect sense it's representing God's people at the end of the world. Because it said, if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, the promise given to Abraham was the land and the, the birth, this, this new birth promise, right, through Christ. So the seed here was to go into a land that they were going to be afflicted 400 years and at the end of that 400 years, that nation was going to be judged and the Lord was going to bring them out with great substance. And we know this is dealing with God's people, the, the ancient Israelites, okay, the type, going into literal Israel, into captivity. So, um, what we have is, prior to the reform line starting, is a period of darkness. Now, I want to also explain how, how that darkness comes about. Um, 
it says in the Zara of Ages 32, it says, But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. After what he said, they shall come out with great substance. And in, um, so it, it, the point is made here is that the, the, the illustration given to Abraham is that they would be in darkness, right? So it says that through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, it pointed to this time period where they would be in Egypt in darkness. And the next quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, 540, paragraph 6, it says, As the children of Israel celebrated the deliverance that God had wrought for their fathers, and his miraculous preservation of them during their journeyings from Egypt, we should gratefully call to mind the various ways he has devised for bringing us out from the world and from the darkness of error into the precious light of his grace. So the darkness that they were in was because of the, the, the wrong understanding, wrong concepts of God. And he delivers us through this re re reformation period into his glorious light, out of that darkness. Next quote from First Spirit of Prophecy, page 93. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and promised him that his seed should be like the stars of heaven for number. He also made known to him, through the figure of the horror of great darkness which came upon him, the long servile bondage of his descendants in Egypt. Okay, So there's this great period where they're in darkness, and that whole period of darkness would go all the way up until they're, they're delivered at the end here. So, But what I want us to understand is, near the end of that darkness, this light comes, and that light is this reform light that's going to take them step by step out of that darkness so that they are delivered. Okay, now let's understand what, uh, what causes the darkness, right? In Genesis chapter 3.15, we have this first prophecy. It's the first gospel prophecy. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this was this promise that Christ puts between the two seeds, the seed of uh, Cain, which is the seed of Satan, and the seed of um, Seth. Uh, after uh, Abel died, the, the Seth was raised up, and through his seed would come the, the promised re Redeemer. So these two seeds, the Lord promised that he would put enmity between them in this uh, was the first prophecy. So there would always be two seeds, right? And um, basically what, what the Bible teaches is that we're not to mingle with an unholy seed because it has consequences. And we, we will see that here when we read Patriarchs and Prophets 81. It says, For some time the two classes, or two seeds, remain separate, the race of Cain spreading from the place of their first settlement, dispersed over the plains and valleys where the children of Seth had dwelt, and the latter, in order to escape from their contaminating influence, withdrew to the mountains, and there made their home. So long as this separation continued, they maintained the worship of God in its purity. But in the lapse of time, they ventured little by little to mingle with the inhabitants of the valleys. So now the two seeds are mingling. This association was productive of the worst results. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. The children of Seth, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by intermarrying with them. Many of the worshippers of God were beguiled into sin by the allurements that were now constantly before them, and they lost their peculiar holy character. Mingling with the depraved, they became like them in spirit and in deeds. The restriction of the seventh commandment were disregarded, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The children of Seth went in the way of Cain. 
They fixed their minds upon worldly prosperity and enjoyment and neglected the commandments of the Lord. Men did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Therefore God gave them over to a mind void of judgment. Sin spread abroad in the earth like a deadly leprosy. So the, we know that the Alpha and Omega is also parallel with the natural teaches us the spiritual. So this marriage of these two seeds, the ungodly seed with the righteous seed, brought evil results because the ungodly would always turn the minds of the godly to the ways of the world. So we see that, that what, what, how it began and slowly but surely it led down to this result. And it says here in four letters and manuscripts, uh, <clears throat> 1885, paragraph 10, the Lord suffered his people Israel to go into bondage in Egypt because they did not walk in his ways, but dishonored him by their continual transgressions. Here, subjected to oppression and hard servitude, they could not keep God's Sabbath. And by their long mingling with the nation of idolaters, their faith became confused and corrupted. Association with the ungodly and unbelieving will have the same influence upon those who believe the present truth, unless they keep the Lord ever before them, so that his spirit shall be their shield. Next quote, Patriarchs and Prophets 260. Words like these destroyed the hopes of many of the Israelites. The case appeared to them very much as the Egyptians had represented. It was true that they were slaves and must endure whatever their cruel taskmasters might choose to inflict. Their children had been hunted and slain and their own lives were a burden, yet they were worshipping the God of heaven. If Jehovah were indeed above all gods, surely he would not thus leave them in bondage to idolaters. But those who were true to God understood that it was because of Israel's departure from him, because of their disposition to marry with heathen nations, thus being led into idolatry, that the Lord pitted, permitted them to become bondmen. And they confidently assured their brethren that he would soon break the yoke of the oppressor. So, the period of darkness, darkness is because of error. Right? It's important that we understand that. That error came about because of the mingling of the two seeds. So there's a mingling of the two seeds. And the mingling of these two seeds not only brings them into darkness, but it brings them into captivity, into bondage. Right? So they were in captivity in Egypt. So this is the point that I want to see always comes before the reform line. You have this captivity, this bondage that God's people are in. It is because of the mingling of two seeds and it brings them into darkness and that darkness is based upon error because the, the minds of these idolatrous people led God's people to also be idolatrous and their hearts became darkened. And this is what this darkness is representing. So the Lord in his mercy, he brings a message that's going to reform them, right? To take them from where they are in this broken, dark, uh, sinful condition and lead them back to where they were in the beginning, okay? And that's, that's how God is going to save his people. So this is the Alpha. It's the type. It's the natural demonstration. So it's represented by a, a literal marriage of two classes and... Um, Obviously, that has a spiritual understanding. We'll see that as we come down to the Omega. But we are dealing with the line of Moses. And, uh, put that in place there. Um, and uh, what, last one thing, just so it's this four captivity in Egypt. We have this number 400 years. It was to, to last for. Okay. <clears throat> But at another point, what I want to understand, or what I want us to understand, is that the mingling of these two seeds is, there's a principle in the Bible called the mystery of iniquity. And the mystery of iniquity is the mingling of truth with error. And this is what's been symbolized by this, this marriage. And if we look at this, it says, 
In Luke 8, verse 11, it says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. But in Matthew 13, 38, it says, The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So both the, the, the word, which is truth, is, is being uh, paralleled with uh, God's people and Satan's children. So basically truth and error is a parallel to God's uh, children and, and, and Satan's children. They're both the seed. You've got the seed of Satan, the seed of Christ. The seed of Christ has the truth. The seed of Satan holds on to error. This is the, the correlation between the two. So if you marry a heathen and you're in the truth, you're mixing yourself with error. And this is the, the point that needs to be understood. Because it says in 1 John 3 and verse 9 and 10, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, the word remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. So it's these two, two children. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So these are the two seeds, and the mingling of these two things together brings uh, terrible results. It brings darkness, it brings captivity. Um, in the book of education page 230 it says it is a fact widely ignored though never without danger that error rarely appears for what it really is it is by mingling or attaching itself to truth that it gains acceptance the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil caused the ruin of our first parents and the acceptance of a mingling of good and evil is the ruin of men and women today. The mind that depends upon the judgment of others is certain sooner or later to be misled. So the Bible says, can two walk together lest they be agreed? And in some sense that has a relationship to marriage. Can two people of two opposing thoughts become married? Will they walk the same path? This is the point, right? So... And this is the illustration it teaches about uh, the, the, the two seeds, truth and error mingling itself is deceptive in its appearance. Um, <clears throat> and second mind, character and personality, page 699, it says there are but two parties. Satan works with his crooked, deceiving power and through strong delusions he catches all who do not abide in the truth. Who have turned away their ears from the truth and have turned to fables. Satan himself abode not in the truth. He is the mystery of iniquity. Through his subtlety he gives his soul destroying errors the appearance of truth. Herein is their power to deceive. So the mystery of iniquity is when truth attaches itself to error or, or vice versa. And this is what makes it so deceptive. It looks like truth. It looks like the real thing, but it's actually error. And in the Garden of Eden, this test between, um, you know, the Eve was tested by Satan. He made himself appear as something that was good, and his, but his words were mingled with error. It was this deception that she accepted because she was, she was not wise uh, of being guarded upon this point. And she was deceived. And this is what brought about the darkness on this planet. So <clears throat> Satan is, wants to be like God. He, he also changeth not. He uses the same tactics. Those tactics worked in the beginning. And they're going to work all the way through to the end. And this is what the Bible is teaching us. So right from the beginning here, we have the plan that Satan uses to attach error to the truth to put it, wrap it up in, a, in something that looks like truth, but really it's error. And if you receive it, it takes you into darkness. But so Christ is going to rescue us from that darkness by bringing a message of light, right? And dispelling that darkness and leading us down step by step through the reception of messages of truth to cleanse our hearts. This is the former reign and prepare us to receive the latter rain, the, the finishing work. This is what we, we were looking at. So let's look at this now. So this is because of the mingling of truth and error through the mingling of the two seeds 
that's brought them into this, this bondage right here. So, <clears throat> next point I want to look at is the fourth generation. Um, <clears throat> in Genesis 15, verses 13 to 16, it says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the prophecy given to Abraham was, would be that in the fourth generation, right, now this is something... Um, for them, it was literal. It was talking about uh, uh, something literal. But for us, it's something symbolic, this fourth generation. In Exodus chapter 6, it shows us that Moses was the fourth generation. Right. So in verse 16, it says, These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merari, Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shimni, according to their families, and the sons of Kohath, Amram, and Itzar, and Hebron, and Utziel, the years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. And the sons of Merari, Mahali, and Mushi, these are the families of Levi according to their generations. And Amram took Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses, and the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. So there's four generations there. It begins with Kohath, then it goes to, uh, sorry, Levi to Kohath, Kohath to Amram, Amram to Moses. Right? So, and what I want us to understand is that what's marking the time of the end here is the birth of Moses. The birth of Moses is marking this fourth generation. He's the fourth generation from Levi, okay? Because the, the original uh, descendants were the 12 tribes, and Levi is one of the original descendants. So the, the prophecy was in the fourth generation, you shall come out with great substance. So... You show there Moses is the fourth generation. It's marking this point. And he is typifying Christ, the deliverer. Right? So I want to mark this here. That what's marking the end of the darkness is the birth of Moses. Because he's typifying the birth of Christ. We will see that. So let's just write that on here. Birth of Moses. And it's the fourth generation. Now it's very important because in, in the, four, the fourth generation is marked in the law. You just go to Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> we go to the second commandment. Um, verse 4 it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, basically, the judgments of God. When, when somebody sins, you, you pass that on down to the fourth generation. It's the fourth generation is symbolizing the last generation where God is going to do a wonderful work in the earth. So the fourth generation is just a symbol of the end of the world, the last generation where the Lord says, unto the fourth generation, the iniquity will go. It won't go anywhere past that. So all these past Histories with us being four generations, they're all typifying the end of the world. And this is what this is typifying. This is what the Lord has shown us line upon line, how he's going to bring things about at the end of the world. So Moses, the Alpha of Bible prophecy, 
typifying this birth of Christ, marking the fourth generation, marking the point when the fourth generation is going to come, which is typifying the end of the world where the Lord is going to do this great work in reforming the people at the end of the world. Um, <clears throat> so, in Genesis 15, verse 3, it says, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So this was the promise given to Abraham that his seed would be as, as many as the stars uh, in heaven for, for the number. Right? And if you go to Galatians chapter 4, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So we can see here that the promise given to Abraham was fulfilled through the birth of Christ. This was the promised heir that was going to be given to him. And Christ is typifying his people at the end of the world, and we'll see that. But the point that I want to see is that the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham was speaking about Christ. Yet he clearly spoke about they were going to be taken into Egypt for 400 years and then they would come out with great substance. So the promise given to Abraham speaking about the end of the world. Egypt's a type of the world, right? But it has to be fulfilled literally first. So it's speaking about the literal Jewish nation. And, but the seed that was promised to Abraham was speaking about Christ. So there's, there, there has to be a, a, a type in that history that's in this uh, 400 years of bondage that's going to come to, to deliver them. And this is what we, we have to understand. Um, it says in Patriots and Prophets 330, paragraph 4, Moses was a type of Christ. So the Alpha is the, is the type of Moses is a type of Christ. So the birth of Moses, the fourth generation, is marking this type. So although the seed of Abraham was pointed to Christ, it's been typified by the birth of Moses, who's in this liter the time period of this literal captivity in Egypt. Right? And we'll see how the literal captivity in Egypt is just symbolizing the captivity to sin, which Christ is going to come to deliver us of. And it says here in Genesis chapter 15, verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones uh, from hence. So, the Lord promises that he would visit his people. And in Acts chapter 7, verses 17 and 18, it says, But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Okay, so, um, so it tells us very, very clearly here that the... The promise of the deliverance of the children of God from Egypt um, is the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham. Okay, this seed that he was promised. And at that time, it says, there was another king arose which knew not Joseph. Now, when Joseph first went down into the land, he, we, we know this, this story, he was favoured of uh, Pharaoh there. Pharaoh was a good king. 
But the, after this, another king arises and he does not know Joseph and he begins to oppress God's people. And what we understand is that when Moses was born, Mark in the fourth generation, there was a death decree that came against him. Right? Let's look at that. Yeah. It says in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. So the parents knew that the time of the promise was coming to pass. They, they knew that this death decree that come forth was to try and kill that promise. Or at least they, they understood that. And they went forward by faith and they hid their son, uh, believing that he might have been the one that was uh, to fulfill the promise. And he was. And it says here in Patriarchs and Prophets 2.40, Joseph outlived his father 54 years. He lived to see Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought upon Joseph's knees. He witnessed the increase and prosperity of his people, and through all the years of his faith in God's restoration of Israel to the land of promise was unshaken. When he saw that his end was near, he summoned his kinsmen about him, honoured as he had been in the land of the pharaohs, Egypt was to him but the place of his exile. His last act was to signify that his lot was cast with Israel. His last words were, God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he took a solemn oath of the children of Israel that they would carry up his bones with them to the land of Canaan. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And through the centuries of toil which followed, the coffin, a reminder of the dying words of Joseph, testified to Israel that they were only sojourners in Egypt and bade him keep their hopes fixed upon the land of promise, for the time of deliverance would surely come. So the promise, when God would visit them, was a time of deliverance, right? So in order to be delivered, God would raise up a deliverer, and we'll see that as Moses. It says, the king and his counsellors had hoped to subdue the Israelites with hard labour and thus decrease their numbers and crush out their independent spirit. Failing to accomplish their purpose, they proceeded to more cruel measures. Orders were issued to the women whose employment gave them opportunity for executing the command to destroy the Hebrew male children at their birth. Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was to be raised up among the Israelites. And by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. But the women feared God and dared not ex execute the cruel mandate. The Lord approved their course and prospered them. The king, angry at the failure of his design, made the command more urgent and extensive. The whole nation was called upon to hunt out and slaughter the helpless victims. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. While this decree was in full force, a son was born to Amram and Jochebed, devout Israelites of the tribe of Levi. The babe was a goodly child, and the parents believing that the time of Israel's release was drawing near, and that God would raise up a deliverer for his people, determined that their little one should not be sacrificed, Faith in God strengthened their hearts, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. But the prince of evil had still had a still deeper object in manifesting his wonders through the magicians. He well knew that Moses, in breaking the yoke of bondage from off the children of Israel, prefigured Christ, who was to break the reign of sin over the human family. So the work of the birth of Christ and Mo the work of Moses was prefiguring the work of Christ, breaking them from the bondage to sin. So bondage in Egypt is a symbol of our captivity in sin. Okay, so type must meet antitype. We'll come on to the antitype later. So the promise given to Abraham was spoken about 
Christ, right? This was the promise given to Abraham. And just, if you see this, just go to um, Galatians chapter 3. Okay, in verse 22 it says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might even be to them that believe. I just want to look for... Ah, okay, verse 18, excuse me. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So th this is talking about the promise given to Abraham. And... Um, And it says in verse uh, 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promise given to Abraham was about Christ. But the promise also given to Abraham was he would deliver them from Egypt. So these two prophecies here are mingled together, right? So the, the deliverance from Egypt was by Moses, a type of Christ. And then the Egypt itself, the bondage in Egypt, was typifying the bondage to sin, which Christ came to deliver them from. So you see type and anti-type. So it's, it's very nice when you, you, you see that. So this is why we're looking at Moses as the Alpha. And when we come to Christ, he's the, he's the Omega, the type anti type natural, the spiritual. So the point I want to see is that the, right here it says there's a Pharaoh arises that knows not uh, Moses. So we're going to write that here. Pharaoh arises. I'll put here a new Pharaoh arises. Okay? So when this new Pharaoh comes on the scene, he knows not Moses, he oppresses them, puts a death decree in place that marks the fourth generation, that marks the birth of Moses, which is a type of Christ, speaking about the end of the world. And we must understand that because the whole Bible is speaking about the end of the world because there's no new thing at the end of the world. So all these things that have been is that which shall be. And this is what we are demonstrating. So whenever the... whenever oppression comes whenever oppression comes and whenever this uh, time period comes the Lord sends light because they're in darkness right there's only light that sets you free he says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free it's the truth that breaks you from the bondage of sin which is brought about by darkness so the Lord's going to send light right at this point and it comes to an increase of knowledge of God because Error is a lack of knowledge of God. It says in Patriarchs and Prophets 2.45, The elders of Israel were taught by angels that the time for their deliverance was near, and that Moses was the man whom God would employ to accomplish this work. Angels instructed Moses also that Jehovah had chosen him to break the bondage of his people. So Moses was the one that was raised up there, typifying Christ. But, you know, Moses also did not understand this correctly. In Patriarchs and Prophets 2.45, it says, He, speaking about Moses, supposing that they were to obtain their freedom by force of arms, expected to lead the Hebrew host against the armies of Egypt. Now, pay attention to this. So Moses in his fleshly carnal mind thinks highly of himself that he's been raised up now and he's going to take God's people, he's going to fight against the Egyptians, right? This is his mindset. And having this in view, he guarded his affections, lest in his attachment to his foster mother or to Pharaoh, he would not be free to do the will of God. 
It goes on to say, Moses remained at court until he was 40 years of age. His thoughts often turned upon the abject condition of his people and he visited his brethren in their servitude and encouraged them with the assurance that God would work for their deliverance. Often stung to resentment by the sight of injustice and oppression, he burned to avenge their wrongs. One day while thus abroad, seeing an Egyptian smiting an Israelite, he sprang forward and slew the Egyptian. Goes on to say in Peter and Proverbs 247, uh, paragraph 3. In slaying the Egyptian, Moses had fallen into the same error so often committed by his fathers of taking into their own hands the work that God had promised to do. So Moses, pulling his sword, slaying the Egyptian because he thought he had this mindset that it was through him that he was going to deliver them and they was going to, God's people were going to raise up an army and fight against the Egyptians. And this was error. He took it into his own hands, right? It says, It was not God's will to deliver his people by warfare, as Moses thought, but by his own mighty power, that the glory might be ascribed to him alone. Yet even this rash act was overruled by God to accomplish his purposes. Moses was not prepared for his great work. He had yet to learn the same lesson of faith that Abraham and Jacob had been taught, not to rely upon human strength or wisdom, but upon the power of God for the fulfillment of his purposes. Now, remember, we were shown this, that the reform line is the time period of the latter reign. And the latter reign has the former and the latter. And the latter reign, when it comes, it's the power of God unto salvation. So it's very important that we understand that without this Power, we can do nothing. It's done in human strength. And this is what Moses was trying to do. So what I want to show is that at the, the time period here, there's two classes. There's one represented by Moses here who comes forward with his sword, trying to do it in his own strength. And then we'll see what the Lord does with Moses. He takes him down another route and shows him now how he's to do it in, in God's strength. And these are these two classes being illustrated. It goes on to say, and there were other lessons that amid the solitude uh, of the mountains Moses was to receive. In the school of self-denial and hardship, he was to learn patience, to temper his passions. Before he could govern wisely, he must be trained to obey. His own heart must be fully in harmony with God before he could teach the knowledge of his will to Israel. By his own experience, he must be prepared to exercise a fatherly care over all who needed his help. So Moses' mind, he'd been 40 years in the courts of Egypt and he thought that he was this, it was all about him, right? Now he had to go 40 years in the wilderness to learn it's all about God. And these are these two classes, the, the contrast between the two mindsets that will be at the end of the world. It goes on to say in the book of Education, page 65, In the military schools of Egypt, Moses was taught the law of force. And so strong a hold did this teaching have upon his character that it required 40 years of quiet and communion with God and nature to fit him for the leadership of Israel by the law of love. The same lesson Paul had to learn. See, Paul, great man. Moses, great man. But it wasn't like that at the beginning. Paul was persecuting and murdering God's people, thinking he was righteous, all based upon a literal understanding of God's word, same as Moses. But they were not understanding the, the symbolic aspects of God's word, that there's a power in them, and it was by submitting themselves to God, trusting in God, that they would see these things in the right context, and God would be glorified and not man. Back to Patriarchs and Prophets, page 248, it says, Moses had been learning much that he must unlearn. The influences that had surrounded him in Egypt, the love of his foster mother, his own high position as the king's grandson, the dissipation on every hand, the refinement, the subtlety and the mysticism of a false religion, the splendor of idolatrous worship, the solemn grandeur of architecture and scripture all had left deep impressions upon his developing mind. 
and had molded to some extent their habits and character, time, change of surroundings and communion with God could remove these impressions. It would require on the part of Moses himself a struggle as for life to renounce error and accept truth. See, Moses had this concept and he took it upon his own self thinking it was about him because of error. He now had to accept truth. So the error would be removed and replaced with truth. But God would be his helper when the conflict should be too severe for human strength. So let's look at that now. You've got this um, Moses in the, the, the courts of Egypt for 40 years. He became a general. He was well loved by everybody. And yet he thought it was all about him. Yet Moses, who had now been in the, the wilderness for 40 years, was humble and meek and had no trust in himself whatsoever. Two contrasting uh, seeds, two contrasting thoughts within God's church. And this is what this is trying to teach us. And it will be the same at the end of the world. There will be people that think it's all about them to go ahead. They think that God is with them and God is needing them to to take down this uh, monstrosity Babylon at the end of the world in their own strength. And the other class will realize that it's all about God's glory and they will humble themselves and wait upon him and trust that he is the one that's going to do it through them when they become molded and shaped like putty in his hands. This is the gospel. So, in Go to Exodus chapter 3, <coughs> verse 1. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he fed the flock on the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So what we want to do now is... We want to show that um, this is this time period of right here, 40 years. I know that there was two periods of 40 years, but I'm just showing this, it's showing the contrast of two different mindsets. There's this group of 40 years, and he's at the end of it now, and he comes to the burning bush, right? And we mark this here, and we'll show as we go through that this is marking the point where the Lord now comes to Moses at the end of this wilderness experience and gives him this message and now sends him forward to, to give a message. It's the point where uh, Moses is now ready and he is sent. N nice uh, point to remember. And we'll just put all these things in place and then we'll prove it all uh, as we, we go through. And Moses said, I will, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. There's the command, he's going to send him. That thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh. See, Moses at this point now, he's no longer trusting in himself. And that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. 
When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And I am that I am means I save the way which I save. And this was God's part of God's character. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up, uh, bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, Thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favour in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbour, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So Moses gets given this, this promise. He's sent to uh, God's people, he's told that Pharaoh will not let you go, but you're to go nonetheless, and the Lord will demonstrate his mighty power. So, basically, you have this, this knowledge comes right here to deliver Moses out of the bondage of error, and he's ready right here, and now Moses gets sent. So, it always marks from the point of the fourth generation, this time of persecution, light comes, leads up to a messenger being raised up and then that messenger is sent. That's, that's a pattern that we will see over and over again. And remember in Isaiah 28 and 9 and 10 we said, Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Now, a precept is a rule or a law, and it governs how we go about things. So, in God's Word, there is the Ten Commandments. But within the Ten Commandments, within the whole structure of the Bible, there are many precepts, laws, rules, guides of life. And these are the things that we are to follow, right? And what I want us to understand is each one of these reform lines has a theme, and Moses, the alpha of uh, Bible prophecy, when you think of Moses, you think of the law. And I want us to see that this, this whole reform line is all based around God's law, about his precept, about his principles, and Moses himself being a symbol of the, the, the law of, of God. So, um, we'll just put this in place and then we will... Uh, uh, finish off and we will take up the rest of this in the next presentation so in, in every in every line in, in every reform line there's a methodology that gets established and the methodology in this line is about precept upon precept, it's about following God's law and the consequences of not understanding and following God's law and this is what this whole line is teaching us now it says here in Councils for the Church 252, it says, Well would it be for old and young to ponder those words of Scripture 
that show how the place marked by God's special presence should be regarded. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, he commanded Moses at the burning bush, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Jacob, after beholding the visions of the angels, exclaimed, The Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So, um, the principle is here, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. Okay, this is a, a principle when you're dealing with holy things. It goes on to say, in the next uh, paragraph, by example, as well as precept, you must show that you reverence your faith, speaking reverently of sacred things. Never allow one expression of lightness and trifling to escape your lips when quoting scripture. As you take the Bible in your hands, remember that you are on holy ground. Angels are around you, and could your eyes be opened, you would behold them. Let your conduct be such that you will have the impression upon every soul with whom you associate that a pure and holy atmosphere surrounds you. One vain word, one trifling laugh may balance the soul in the wrong direction. Terrible are the consequences of not having a constant connection with God. So, Moses was uh, understanding by precept, right? And, and Isaiah 20 says, the Lord teaches us precept upon precept, right? But these principles, these rules, and um, <clears throat> we'll want to talk about one of those now. Um, okay, so from the time that Moses is sent, we've got to come to this next way, Mark, now we're going to see what happens. It says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 24, so Moses is sent, he's now on his way to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to uh, deliver this message to him. It says, And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Right? So it says the Lord met him. Right? So what happens, the next, next thing is marked, is that the, the Lord comes down and meets him in the way. And he wants to kill him. So why, he asks himself, he just sends him to give a message and now... The Lord wants to kill him. It says, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, that's his wife, and cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So the angel of the Lord, Christ, right here, comes down. And he wants to kill Moses because Moses did not circumcise his son. So we must understand that was something that was written in the law and given to Abraham. And all the people of Israel were required to do that. That was a, it was a, a law that they were to hold to. And it was teaching something spiritual for the end of the world. But type must mean anti-type. So if people, even though... Like, for instance, water baptism. Water baptism has no, um, cannot save you, but it's required according to God's word to do it because you show by your example, right, you're, you're typifying something that, that he's going to do to you. And we must carry out these, these types according to his word in order to glorify God. And there's great purposes in why we do these things. So Moses had failed to circumcise his son, which was to be done on the eighth day. And therefore Christ was going to slay him, right? So he had forgotten to uphold a principle or a precept in God's word. Now it says here, Patriarchs and Prophets 255-256. On the way from Midian, Moses received a startling and terrible warning of the Lord's displeasure. An angel appeared to him in a threatening manner, as if he would immediately destroy him. No explanation was given, but Moses remembered that he had disregarded one of God's requirements. Yielding to the persuasion of his wife, he had neglected to perform the rite of circumcision upon their youngest son. He had failed to comply with the condition by which his child could be entitled to the blessings of God's covenant with Israel. And such a neglect on the part of their chosen leader could not but lessen the force of the divine precepts upon the people. So it was a precept that he was meant to uphold. 
Zipporah, fearing that her husband would be slain, performed the rite herself, and the angel then permitted Moses to pursue his journey. In his mission to Pharaoh, Moses was to be placed in a position of great peril. His life could be preserved only through the protection of holy angels. But while living in neglect of a known duty, he would not be secure, for he could not be shielded by the angels of God. In the time of trouble, just before the coming of Christ, the righteous will be preserved through the ministration of heavenly angels. But there will be no security for the transgressor of God's law. Angels cannot then protect those who are disregarding one of the divine precepts. Precept upon precept, right? So this whole line is all about the keeping of God's precepts. It's about his law. And in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9, here is this precept that he forgot to keep. It says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So, this is the eighth day. And Moses, um, because he didn't carry out this, this right on this day, the angel of the Lord comes down on that very day, says, you never circumcised your son. If you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. Because transgression brings death. And this is what this whole line is teaching us. It's teaching us about the, the necessity to obey God. Our only safety is obeying based upon the covenant that we've made with God. We've, we've agreed uh, through the plan of salvation to obey God. This, this is the, the covenant, right? He, he will blot out our sin if we are obedient to him, right? Um, so, Moses, uh, on the eighth day, failed to carry out the rite of circumcision. And therefore, the angel of the Lord, which is Christ, comes down face to face with him and threatens to kill him. So, right here, we have this life or death scenario dependent upon obedience, right? Okay. So, we're going to stop there, and when we come back in the next presentation, we will finish this off and put all these waymarks. Now, these waymarks are all dependent upon the Bible. It's the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy that mark these waymarks. Many, many things we could talk about at the time of Moses. But we'll see that the, the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are very specific how these specific points are marked out and what marks them. You'll see these repeating patterns that are in these, these different uh, generations and what it means for us. Okay? So um, let us uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this, um, <coughs> this illustration and I want to thank you for the simple way which you promised to save us. If only we would apply faith. Help us, Lord, to study these things out. Help us to realise and understand the principles that it teaches. And as we go through this study, we'll see that these principles become stronger and stronger and they're built upon a platform based upon many witnesses. And it says in your word that there are two or three is a thing established. So help us to establish this truth and show that it's not of any man's devising, but it's a sure and firm foundation upon which you will save your people at the end of the world. Help us, Lord, to remember that you said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So help us to understand, to follow, and to humbly submit to your will and not our own weakness.